right. from the colonial times um, forward. Um, and today, uh, Donna Waller is our speaker. I think most of you know Donna. Um, she's a retired history professor from Santa Fe, um, an active community member to this day. Um, and she's uh, always uh, so generous about sharing her time and her efforts um, with us. So today she's going to be speaking about um, uh, the, the, the title, Advent of uh, Mass Politics, but that's bouncing up a couple decades, uh, starting in 1828. By the way, I'll say just one other thing. Donna has been learning PowerPoint. And you will see the the results of her work. Um, some some bright, colorful slides. Uh, so Donna, please take it away. Oh, oh. Good morning, everybody. Um, I wish I could I could take credit for um, the PowerPoint, but I was just telling some folks in the back. Um, Barbara Oberlander taught me how to make a PowerPoint yesterday. So um, you guys are, are a great experiment, and it's proof that lifelong learning is possible. Um, and um, I told her next week's I would try to do myself, but she should look forward to me calling and showing up at her house and saying, "Oh, would you please do this for me?" Um, I had I, I was I'm capable of finding the slides, but I had actually never even noticed that I had a PowerPoint program on my computer um, because Julianne used to put those together for us here. Um, so yes, this is a great experiment, um, and I hope it works. Um, um, I before I start, I I want to I want to tell you that I labored over this, in uh, in a way that I, sometimes I don't have to, and part of the reason for that is that when I taught at Santa Fe, I broke my AMH twenty ten class into three tests, and. Uh, this was the second test, and the period in American history from 1800 to about 1845 is actually maybe next to the constitutional period, my favorite period of American history to think about and talk about. And in my classes at Santa Fe, nine out of 10 students, if they were in the back row in um, my lectures for this period, would hitch back in their seats and go to sleep. And, and once I said to one of the students, you know, this is like really neat and important stuff. And he said, no, it's not. It's all that boring stuff about the economy, instantly teaching me that all Americans want to get rich, but they don't want to have any idea of how historically we got to the point where we could be. Um, said there's, it's all that boring stuff about the economy, and there's only one rinky-dink little war of no importance. That would be the War of 1812 which is referred to by historians as the Second War of American Independence, that rinky-dink little war. He said, mm, there's just like nothing interesting about it. And when he finished, I said, hmm, there's just one thing. Do you like to vote? Sort of looked at me. I said, this is the moment when Human beings on the planet, average human beings, largely get the right to vote. You should be excited about that. Okay. Said, mm, the Louisiana Purchase is good. So <laughs> that, that, was, that was as far as I got. 
but um, the trans the political transformation of America from the point at which Barbara Oberlander left off last week to 1845 is really a remarkable one. And it's one that holds great interest for me. Um, so I'm to some degree going to pick up where Barbara left off and um, then take you through the election of 1840 today. Can I have tea? Okay. Ah, there. there we go. Okay. Um, these folks, you probably recognize, you definitely recognize Jefferson, but um, next to Jefferson is James Madison, who um, is um, actually one of my political heroes. Um, I, I really adore thinking about Madison as an intellectual. He's really a remarkable guy. But they're up there together because... Um, after the election of 1800, where Barber left off, these two men dominated American politics for the next 25 years. Jefferson won the election of 1800, and the Democratic-Republican Party went on to hold the presidency until 1828. And um, when Jefferson and Madison, um, who followed him, and uh, an, a, a piece of trivia that I love is you want to notice, if you, if you think about early American history, that um, six of the first six presidents of the United States, four of them are from the state of Virginia. Okay. Um, the dominance of the Virginians is really um, a kind of a remarkable thing, but um, they will tell you it was because they were first, and they were. You know, if you think about Virginia as a colony, they were alone for the first 30 years of the colony's existence. Um, so the Virginians dominate, and essentially, they have two goals. And they are able to execute one of them um, and not able to execute the second one at all. So I will um, sort of dispose of the first one um, rather quickly. Um, one of their great goals, um, and you know about this to some degree from Barbara's lecture, is um, that they wanted to destroy the Federalist Party. And um, the feud that Barbara mentioned between Adams and Jefferson was so deep and bitter that it really did manifest itself as a democratic republican goal to just roll right over the top of those people forever and um they were actually able to accomplish that um with a lot of help from the federalist party itself um the federalists disappeared totally from the scene in the wake of the War of 1812 um, because they thought it was a bad idea, Mr. Madison's war. And when we won it and it produced a, an, an absolute groundswell of giddy patriotism in America, and also produced Andrew Jackson as a national hero, the Federalists were totally discredited by their non-support of the war. And so 
by 1818, a decade before the Jacksonian Revolution, um, the Democratic Republicans ruled with no opposition. And they were so powerful that the last Democratic Republican president was John Quincy Adams, John Adams' son. He had become a Democratic Republican. So the desire to wipe the Federalists off the face of the earth was very remarkably executed with a lot of help from the Federalist Party themselves. Now, a big thought and a sort of a tangent, um, and you guys know I love to do this. Um, in my classes at Santa Fe, I used to stop here and I would say, I just told you that the Federalist Party disappeared in 1818. But you folks, at least structurally, live in that world. How do you explain that? And the explanation to that is part of the second thing that the Democratic Republicans wanted to do and failed at utterly because the forces of history rolled right over the top of them. And the second goal was essentially to keep the Republic the way they wanted it to be, which was with limited power to the national government, and with continued allegiance primarily to the states in a political sense. And as I said, the forces of history rolled right over the top of them. For one thing, inside the government itself, despite Jefferson and Madison's best efforts and not so good efforts, the power of the national government expanded. Um, you only have to think about Jefferson buying Louisiana without going to Congress and begging about it. Um, the power of the presidency, despite Jefferson's best efforts was hugely enhanced by both Jefferson and Madison. Um, and um, it was circumstances, Jefferson would have told you this, that forced them to do those things that they actually thought might be unconstitutional. Jefferson actually agonized over the purchase of Louisiana because um, he knew that it was not what he had envisioned for the presidency. And the real reason, of course, we live in um, the Federalist world um, is that the Federalist Party disappeared, but they dominated the federal court system which is appointed for life for a full generation after they had disappeared as a party. And that is embodied by one person, John Marshall, the third chief justice of the Supreme Court, who sat on that court. And when he took position, he said one of his great goals was to be sure that by the time he left office, the national government was clearly supreme over the states. And he stayed on the court for 30 plus years. And every decision he made was made with an eye toward that particular goal. Okay. So what really happens 
um, in the Democratic Republican years is America grows as a nation. You could tell the whole story of American history as a story of progressive nationalization beginning from 13 separate countries in the colonial period. And um, the period I'm talking about today is one of the moments when the national idea really um, gains hold. So despite their desire not to have that happen, Jefferson propels that idea forward as president and John Marshall um, hammers away at it for 30 years in um, the US Supreme Court. But even more important, the, um, the country and history made nationalism um, happen in a lot of different ways. And here are some of the elements of it. Can I go? Let me see. Okay. Um, this is a map of the United States in 1800. Oh. This is a map of the United States in 1830. Okay. The country grew enormously between 1800 and 1828. Six new states entered the Union, and the population grew by about 7 million people in a 25-year period. And much of that growth was west of the Appalachians. And um, this is another moment when um, one of the great themes of American history becomes obvious to everybody. Um, I think of this as the moment of the rise of the West as a concept in American history. And that rise of the West includes um, a good deal of political power as well. Um, the other great nationalizing force besides the, the population and political expansion of the country was that in this period, America becomes an actor in foreign policy for the first time. And uh, again, um, Jefferson, um, despite his desire um, not to be a strong president, um, moves in foreign policy against the Barbary pirates with a considerable amount of aggression and um, absolutely no um, reluctance to ride right over congressional opportunity to do that, I mean, opposition to do that. So um, America as a nation becomes an actor in um, foreign policy, and the country takes great pride in it, which is what kills um, the Federalist Party. And um, in terms of the rise of the West, okay, these are the folks that are out there. Um, I totally love the picture of this frontiersman. Uh, you can tell um, that he spends a good deal of time with the others on the continent. Look at all the indigenous beadwork that he's wearing. Um, and um, he was, um, this is a portrait um, that was simply called the mountain man, okay, the mountain man. Um, and these are um, Westerners 
um, on the Mississippi, hacking their way through through the forest um, and settling up um, there, um, trying trying to um, settle out there. And um, the settlement of the West was chaotic. Um, some people owned land, some people didn't. Um, some people simply did what these people did, hacked their way through the forest until they found a place they liked and said, oh, we'll just stay here, squatters. Um, and that caused a good deal of confusion um, in later periods of American history. Um, but um, another thing that propelled a great deal of political change, and by the way, I'm showing a bias here that you folks might not recognize, which is um, that some people actually think politics determine what goes on. I have a tendency to think that the political structure reflects what's going on in other aspects of the culture and grabs hold and tries to manage it. But it's not like the politicians plan it. They respond to it more often. And um, that's actually the thinking that underlies what I'm saying to you right now, which is that America's politics changed enormously in this period because other things in the, in in America changed enormously. I'm ready. Nope. Next, no. Uh, nope. There. Up. Oh, that's too many. Ah. Okay. And here is the biggest change of all. In the 1820s, a thing that historians call the market revolution occurred in America um, in the wake of the War of 1812, and partly because we were cut off from goods for from Britain, which was our largest trading partner at the time. So... Um, very quickly, um, after the War of 1812, America began to industrialize for the first time. And an aspect of that, I don't have a slide about, but that is very interesting to me, is um, industrialization mostly took place around towns and cities in the East. But another aspect of the market revolution was that because of the War of 1812, Americans, over 90% of them lived in rural areas on, on small family farms. Um, only a very small percentage of Americans lived in cities in the 1820s. But um, rural people were touched by the market revolution because America went into commercial farming for the first time ever after the war, the war of 1812. Before 1812, people lived on their farms and produced. And if they had overage, they went into a village market. But American farmers were not hooked into any kind of international trade at all until after the War of 1812. So after the War of 1812, we get the first textile mills. Here they are. Um, and, but we also get commercial farming, commercial agriculture for the first time after that war. And um, the the textile mills came to be kind of the heart of American industry in its first phase. And you can tell by the other slide who the workers were um, in the first textile mills. Um, they were mostly New England farm girls. And um, there are wonderful essays about the Lowell girls, this is a picture of one, 
working in the Lowell textile mills um, in New England. Um, they were, however, very quickly replaced by ah, by Irish immigrants. Okay. Beginning in the 1820s, and um, the picture of these folks on this ship, I looked at this picture and I thought, how many of them fell off in, in the passage? Look how packed in there they are. And um, this, this is a newspaper sketch of Irish immigrants arriving in New York. Um, in 1830, okay. and um, then um, what was a typical, uh, to the person who drew this sketch, one of the typical Irish immigrant families um, arriving, and they begin arriving in East Port, East, um, East, Eastern port cities in the early 1820s when the potato famine hits in Ireland in the late 1830s, what has been a steady stream becomes a flood of Irish immigrants. So um, the market economy builds factories and produces um, the, the first real wave of immigration since the colonial period in America. And those frontiersmen and those Irish immigrants become the backbone of the Democratic Party, okay, which um, is formed by Andrew Jackson and shaped by his vice president, Martin Van Buren. Okay. Um, Ron was very gracious about my time and energy in this, but I'm totally self-interested because every time I do something like this, I find myself learning something that I hadn't thought about a lot. And um, this time, um, what I did was to focus on Martin Van Buren, who was one of the greatest political organizers that there's ever been in America. Um, and um, his reputation, of course, as president um, is the pits, and I'll explain to you why in a minute. Um, but um, he is actually the architect of the modern Democratic Party and the architect of modern party organization. He was the first one to say, we ought to have a ground operation in every state. I mean, I spent a lot of time this week thinking about how thoroughly he shaped the way modern political parties do things. Um, when um, someone from uh, the Harris campaign told me that um, that in the wake of um, the the nomination, they had had so many volunteers that they couldn't process them because they did not have enough organizers on the ground in a number of states. I had been reading about Van Buren telling the Democrats in 1828 that they better get an organization on the ground in every single state. And um, I tried to picture the New Yorkers arriving in a place like Missouri to try to do political, um, political work. Um, but um, the Democratic Party um, is absolutely um, built on those frontiersmen and on um, 
the Irish immigrants in the eastern seaboard cities. Ah, okay. Okay, all of these changes are in a way symbolized by Andrew Jackson. Okay. Here he is at two points in his career. Um, as a general in the War of 1812. Um, I don't know if any of you are old enough, but the second I started reading this, I started thinking about that song. Oh, okay, some of you are laughing, you know. <laughs> okay, in 1813, right? Who, you know, not a hard one to, to, to remember, <laughs> you know, if you ever, if you ever heard that. Um, but um, Jackson, Jackson has um, one of those careers that is absolutely symbolic of the way the Democrats in the 1830s and 1820s and 30s um, think about America. Um, when he becomes president, he is the first president to be born west of the Appalachians up until that time. As I said, they're all Virginians or from Massachusetts. And Jackson is the first candidate, presidential candidate from the West. Um, he's a military man. He um, gets his reputation at the Battle of New Orleans. Um, not exactly well earned. Um, it's a battle that the British lose more than the Americans win it, but Americans feel great about it. Um, so he becomes a popular hero because of that. Um, and um, Jackson, um, okay, so I, those of you who've heard me speak know that I grapple with a thing when I think about presidents and historical figures. Um, Jackson used to be considered um, a, a great president. And some of what I'm getting ready to tell you about, by historians, about is the reason he was considered a great president. But um, his reputation has slid as we have become more and more alert um, to the nastiness of destroying the people who owned the land in the first place. And the way Jackson actually cements his reputation in America in his own time is after the War of 1812, he goes on to be an Indian fighter. And he is responsible for um, removing all of the Indians west of the Mississippi when he is president. Um, as an Indian fighter, he defeats in very savage battles all of the southern Indian tribes. And he manages to steal Florida from the Spanish um, in a very deliberate fashion. Um, Florida history is bound up with Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson, I think about when I grew up in Florida, and um, I think about sometimes what I knew about presidents when I was in junior high and high school. And oddly enough, because I'm a Floridian, I knew about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson because we all had to take Florida history when I was in school. And um, Jackson is genuinely responsible for the fact that the United States got Florida. So um, he goes on to be a military hero in the War of 1812. Um, and then um, he 
cements that reputation, that military reputation, by um, defeating the southern Indian tribes. And by 1824, he is hands down the most popular political figure in America. And the older politicians are appalled by this. Okay. Barbara told you about the horrible rupture between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams last week. And after the election of 1800, Adams and Jefferson did not speak to each other for 25 years. And the thing that caused them to repair their feud and begin a correspondence again at the end of their lives was their terror at the thought that Andrew Jackson was going to become president. Jackson, that, that is literally the truth. That is literally the truth. And um, I'm getting ready to lay what is probably my favorite piece of presidential trivia at all on you guys. Um, that, that feud was an amazing kind of thing. And ultimately, Jefferson and Adams died on July, both of them, on July 4th. 1826, and their last piece of correspondence was about the dangers of Andrew Jackson okay, in 1826. Um, yeah, Jefferson died on the, on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, and um, there, there's a story, I don't know whether it's apocryphal or not, um, but that, but that, as Jefferson was dying, he said, um, "Does Adams still live?" And the answer to that was yes, but only for about six hours more. And um, they both went out on the same day. But their feud over that election in 1800 was healed by their absolute fear of this man taking power amazing kind of thing. So in 1824, Jackson is the most popular person in America, and he runs for president. John Quincy Adams, who has held or, or who will go on to become president, um, does not want him. The electoral college vote ends up tied, and ultimately another player, and this is another reason why the students hated listening to me talk about this period, um, is it's full of amazing politicians. And the greatest one, to me, the greatest American politician who never became president is Henry Clay of Kentucky. And in the election of 1824, um, ultimately when the electoral votes are tied, Clay throws his votes to John Quincy Adams because self-interested, Clay is from Kentucky, Jackson is from Tennessee, Clay does not believe the West is big enough for two major politicians, and he wants it to be him, not Jackson. He sees Jackson as the enemy. So he throws his electoral college votes to, um, to John Quincy Adams, who becomes president. Jackson instantly dubs it a corrupt bargain. It was not. It was simply 
a regular political deal like the ones that had been going on since the founding of the Republic. But Jackson dubs it the a corrupt bargain. He, this is the event that causes him to form the Democratic Party. He breaks away from the Republican dominance and um, he um, joins with Martin Van Buren and on the old base of the Democratic Republican Party, which was partly small farmers in the South, he adds those Western frontiersmen and Martin Van Buren brings in the Irish. Um, Tammany Hall had been in existence since the 1790s in New York, but by the 1820s, Van Buren and some of the Irish leaders had taken over Tammany Hall and dubbed it the Knights of St. Tammany, um, which, it, um, which it comes to be known as for a long time. And um, on that base, they build the Democratic Party, and Jackson is its hero and its symbol, and Martin Van Buren is its architect. And they do two things of enormous significance on, on the ground in all those states, and especially the new states, the Democrats convince the state legislatures to drop property qualifications for voting. So that by the election of 1828, every state has universal white male suffrage. Right. It's an enormous breakthrough. It's why the age of Jackson is known as the age of democracy. And the other thing, and this is mostly Van Buren's work that they do while they're convincing the legislatures to drop the property qualifications, is to get the legislatures to enact a popular vote to instruct the presidential electors. Up until 1828, the Electoral College is the kind of insider game that Dr. Oberlander described to you last week. Okay. What Jackson and Martin Van Buren do is to get every state in the union to choose the electors by popular vote. And this is the point at which most Americans, for the first time, get to cast a vote in terms of the presidency. And by 1828, Martin Van Buren, this great political organizer, has totally changed the electoral system and shaped it into the one we have today. Um, if you had seen the presidential election in 1800, there would have been nothing about it that resembled what we have today. And if you had seen the election in 1828, and definitely by Jackson's second term in 1832, you would have seen everything we do today absent television and electronics okay it was um it it's simply they simply um turned the democratic party into a democratic force 
for the first time. And this was the thing that um, Jackson, that Jefferson and Adams saw coming and greatly feared. Um, the founders were not fans of democracy. They were fans of popular consent, but not democracy. And they absolutely understood that what they were seeing was something that um, might, they saw it as endangering the Constitution. Um, but the Democratic Party built by, by um, Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren also has the distinction of being the first national party. You might recall that Dr. Oberlander told you that um, generally speaking, the Democratic Republicans were in the South and the Federalists were in the Northeast, that there were regional bases. By the election of 1836, the Democratic Party had a base in the Northeast, in the Eastern Seaboard cities. It had the old Jeffersonian base of small farmers in the South, and it had the population of the ever expanding West. So it was the first truly national party in that regard. Um, and um, this last picture um, is Andrew Jackson in 1845, right before he died. And if you don't know anything about Jackson. I'm not gonna not gonna go into it here, but when I say he's a real frontier type, um, uh, I mean that absolutely. When he ran for president in 1828, people said, no, he's killed people. You can't, <laughs> you can't. I mean other other not just Indians, but other other white people. He was a dueler. And when you look at this last picture of him, um, one of the things modern historians think was that he was dying from lead poisoning. He had um, bullets lodged in his body from duels and wounds. They were made out of lead. One of them was really near his spinal column. They couldn't do anything about it. And um, you can tell by looking at the picture of him that um, he spent his last years in terrible pain. And um, many people think he was mentally um, affected by, by lead poisoning. Um, but um, it, when I say he was a true Western type, he was a brawler. He made his fortune racing horses, raising, raising race horses and then became a cotton planter. Some of you have probably seen the Hermitage, which was his grand plantation house. Um, but he was up from log cabin nothingness um, to that. Um, he was really a, a traditional American figure. Um, so um, by 1828, everything had changed. And uh, what elected Jackson were sort of the trappings of mass politics is the way I think about it. The election of 1828, um, like many elections, and including the one you heard about last week, um, was fought out in newspapers and pamphlets. Um, but Here's another measure of how life had changed. In 1790, oh, think about how this placed, I, I, I'm getting, I talk to myself, you can tell. I, had, I just thought of something I hadn't thought about. Um, in um, 1790, there were 90 new, major newspapers in America. 
think about today. Um, by 1828, there were 400 of them. And um, many Americans at the time were not well educated, but 90% of them were literate. Okay. They were literate. So there were 400 newspapers. Okay. The 1828 campaign was fought out in the newspapers and in pamphlets. Um, and um, the, the other thing that we saw for the first time, and this is part of what would have really terrified Jefferson and Adams if they had lived to see it, was um, mass rallies. For the first time, people showing up at mass rallies, torchlight parades, campaigning face-to-face -face for presidential candidates. I mean, think about the election of 1800. Adams and Jefferson hate each other, not because they've said anything, because gentlemen don't campaign in 1800. Their supporters said all that horrible stuff in the newspapers, but they themselves in, in the early Republic, being a politician was an insult. You know, at looking for public support, that was, that was considered um, worse than tacky, worse than tacky. In 1828, there are mass rallies. The candidates directly report them. Um, when um, when the Democratic Republicans don't want to nominate, I mean, there's a remnant of them still around. They don't want to nominate Jackson in 1828. He says, fine, the Democratic Party will hold the first major political convention in America and my party will nominate me. So that by the end of the election of 1828, you've got mass campaigning, you've got universal suffrage, you've got a popular vote, and you've got political conventions. The whole shape of the modern party system is in place by the election of 1828. And I want to give you Martin Van Buren there. Um, you should look at some pictures of him. Um, Barbara and I picked, pushed, pulled up another, um, a, a real photograph of him yesterday. And um, it was just a face shot. And I looked at it and said, wow, look at how intelligent he looks. I mean, I mean he, he has a, just a very canny, smart face um, for a person that is much neglected in American politics. So all of it works. And Andrew Jackson gets elected. And as one of the newspapers of the time put it, for Jackson's inauguration, King Mob came to Washington. Okay. Before Jackson's election, there were um, Inaugurations were small, private affairs, um, mostly attended by the elite. Thousands of people converged on Washington for Jackson's inauguration. 
They trashed the White House. Jackson had to escape out a window at one point. They had a huge three-day party. Um, and this is a newspaper rendering of what it looked like, King Mob coming to Washington. And um, this is also the first public inauguration. And um, one of the other things left over from the older republic that um, doesn't go away and stays with us right down to this day is character assassination and scandal. Um, Jackson's um, wife, Rachel, particularly, comes under attack in the campaign um, to such a degree that um, she, she died very quickly after Jackson was elected president. And um, Jackson always believed that his political enemies had caused her death by writing all of these terrible stories about her, um, which is one of the reasons he went after his political enemies in a particularly vicious and personal way. Um, they're, they're, um, he felt that um, their scandal mongering had actually killed his wife. So um, we have the shape of modern politics here. Um, and the Democratic Party is the only party that exists for about 15 seconds, okay? Jackson is so remarkably controversial that, and this is not an understatement, the Whig Party, which becomes the opposition party, is simply formed initially on the basis of hatred and fear of Andrew Jackson and total dislike of his policies. And this is the way Jackson is seen by his enemies. Oops. Oh, there's Jackson's inauguration. I forgot we had put that in. Right. Public and on the steps of the White House in front of thousands of people, literally. This is how he was seen. Okay. Um, many people felt that um, Jackson wanted to become a dictator. And um, I, I feel the need to tell you that, that um, when people talk about Donald Trump's approach to being president, the president that they most often can compare him to is Andrew Jackson. Um, Jackson absolutely believed that as president, he was the representative of the American people, that he was, you know, after 1828, everybody can vote for the president. And the president is the only official that everyone in America votes for. So um, Jackson sees himself as the, um, the symbolic embodiment of the American people. And he absolutely believes that in their name, he can do a lot more than previous presidents have, um, that, um, that he has the, the position now sort of outside the constitutional system as the representative of the people. And the Whigs, of course, um, find that terrifying. Um, 
and they definitely do not support him. And then he does something that absolutely solidifies the Whigs as a party. Oops. Okay. This is Jackson destroying the Bank of the United States. Okay. Um, part of what had allowed the market revolution to occur was um, that Alexander Hamilton had gotten his wish. The Bank of the United States had been created. It had, in fact, stabilized the economy. And Andrew Jackson hated it. He saw it as a symbol of the elite. He saw it as a symbol of entrenched power. He saw it as rich against poor. Um, and if it sounds like class warfare, yes, indeed, that's what I'm describing. In 1832, the bank came up for recharter. Jackson was running for re-election. He understood that the head of the bank was fueling the Whig Party, and Biddle was. Okay. Jackson took everything personally. He said, the bank is trying to kill me, but I will destroy it. And he vetoed the recharter bill. It's the first time that the president uses a veto for policy or political purposes in this way. The country goes wild. His supporters love it. They see bankers as the enemy. The Whigs, who are the commercial class, they're built on the old Federalist base, are absolutely horrified, and they are galvanized by it. Jackson wins easily in um, 1832, but the Whigs begin to move on defeating him. Okay. He goes out of office in 1832, and Martin Van Buren is lucky or not lucky to actually succeed him after having been Jackson's vice president. Um, the vice presidency is a terrible position to run from for the presidency from. Very few vice presidents get elected in their own right. In fact, I, I want to say, and some of you might, if I'm correct, if I'm incorrect, uh, remind me of this. I don't think any vice president was elected in his own right between Martin Van Buren in 1836 and George H. Bush. Okay. The first George Bush, H.W. Bush, H.W. Bush. Um, the first George Bush. Um, no, no he, he was the first vice president to be elected in his own right since 1836. Not elected. I mean, not until he took over the presidency in the wake of assassination. Yeah, yeah. But um, just initially running for office and electing, nobody but Van Buren gets it. And with Van Buren, you can tell why. The destruction of the bank causes a depression. It is Andrew Jackson's fault but Martin Van Buren was his vice president and the death of the bank and the depression and the pain of the American people 
lands smack on Martin Van Buren. While this is happening, the Whigs are trying to figure out how to take power. And they figure it out. Oh, I left out one small thing. Let me just do this. Oops. Okay. In 1835, this man arrives in America. Um, he is French. And yes, he is as young as he looks in this photograph. He comes to study American prisons. But when he gets here, he's a child of the French Revolution. And he's very interested by democracy. He comes to America and he witnesses Jacksonian America at its height. And here's what he says about American politics in 1835. This is the Jacksonian Revolution in a nutshell. He says, America has a culture of boisterous politics. I love that phrase, boisterous politics. But it is based on individual initiative, a belief in political equality, and an active public sphere. It's totally unlike any other governmental system on the planet at the moment when de Tocqueville sees it. And he actually believes it's going to last. And what I'm going to tell you about the Whigs tells you he's right about that. Um, what he says in Democracy in America, and if anybody in this room feels like 972 wonderful pages, which is what the length of democracy in America is, um, you should read it. De Tocqueville was such a sharp observer and had such a vision of um, what history was going to bring down the pike. He actually thought that America could last as a democracy, which was a thought that nobody had in the 1830s much. And he said the only thing he could see that would bring down the American system was the race war. Okay. He witnessed slavery and he understood that that was in a democracy the crucial problem. And he said if America fails, it's going to fail over race. That's the issue. And I'll leave it to you to think about how correct or not correct that assessment was. Um, but um, de Tocqueville thought that American politics in the 1830s were actually the wave of the future. And that um, whenever I feel that, that the democracy is failing, I I go back to de Tocqueville, try to let him make me feel better about our chances. So the Whigs, the Whigs are watching this. There's been a depression. They're the commercial classes. They're very hurt by it. The issue becomes, how do we beat the Democrats? And the answer becomes, we use all of their techniques and we out Jackson, the Jacksonians. And here comes the election of 1840. Okay. What the Whigs do is to nominate the closest thing they can find to Andrew Jackson. And it's this man, General William Henry Harrison. He seems to have the same biography. He's a hero from the War of 1812. 
He's an Indian fighter. Oops. There he is as president. Okay. He isn't Andrew Jackson, though. Okay. The Whigs absolutely portray him as Andrew Jackson. This campaign is often known in history books as the log, si log cabin or the hard cider campaign because of this. Um, Harrison is pictured next to a log cabin. Hard cider. Who drinks hard cider? Oh, all those frontiersmen out in the West. The only problem with this is Harrison is actually a Virginia Harrison, one of the first families of Virginia. He actually lives in one of those columned mansions. He's one of a handful of Southerners who owns over 100 slaves. But he is marketed as Andrew Jackson reincarnated. Okay. This is the first moment of disinformation in political campaigns. They absolutely portray him as a Western frontier type Indian fighter. Um, and they portray poor Martin Van Buren as an elite New Yorker who drinks champagne and eats off gold plates. Okay. They take all the Jacksonian techniques and they apply them to William Henry Harrison. There's another one. Harrison's campaign um, slogan is Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Um, the Battle of Tippecanoe breaks the back of the natives in um, the Midwest. And um, John Tyler, a Democrat who goes over to the, the Whigs at this point. And armed with all of the techniques that um, the... Um, Jacksonians and the Democrats have created, Harrison wins, beats poor Martin Van Buren at his own game very decisively by portraying William Henry Harrison as Andrew Jackson come again. So, voter turnout in that election, over 80%. Everything has changed. And that remains the same right up through the 1890s. The Democratic Party creates all of these modern techniques that stay with us to, forever. And that is why Jackson was largely considered to be a great president because the age of Jackson is really the high point of democracy for white males only, but it's a huge step forward in terms of the history of the world. And it begins a matter begins really begins America's struggle continuously for um, democratic ideals and begins the dialogue about who will be able to vote, which will continue into my presentation for next week. And I want to end with just one thought, I've thrown it out in various classes to some of you, but it's, it's a big thought that I play with all the time. What you see here is a step toward 
what I think is the, the, the real, um, not a contradiction, but a controversy that, that American politics is about, which is that we have that Republican with a small r structure that the Constitution creates, but over the course of American history, Americans have grafted more and more participation onto that Republican structure. And that's the reason we still wrestle with the issue of the Electoral College. Um, what has happened is our structure, the U.S. Constitution, is not democratic with a small d, but our ideas about participation are. And that's a gift of Andrew Jackson and the Democratic Party. Unfortunately, I always have something to say. <laughs> I'm bursting with ideas. Uh, after Trump's loss of the 2020 election and all the machinations that were going on, what I remember emerging in the discussion from the right wing is that, wait a minute, the Constitution directs that the state legislatures dominate the representation from the Electoral College. The legislatures can change and ignore the popular vote. Um, can you respond to that? Um, can I respond to that? Um, Okay, so the, the Supreme Court, while nobody was watching or while we were watching them do the other things, actually struck a real blow against that idea. Dealing with another topic, um, some of you probably know about Morty Harper, which came down from the Supreme Court last year, which simply said the state legislatures are not omnipotent and they don't have the power to do a lot of things that are being asserted. In this case, um, it was a gerrymandering case. And um, the argument was that the North Carolina legislature could basically do whatever it wanted in terms of drawing the electoral districts. Supreme Court said no, and absolutely stated that electorally speaking, the state legislatures are not omnipotent. So um, that argument legally won't go anywhere. Well, it was the same court that has done all these things that some of us don't like. So it was my, for me, it was like that one glimmer of hope that they were going to keep the political structure intact. Any other, any other questions? This is just a, a this is just a quick question. Um, at that time, in the early nineteenth century, anyone could immigrate. There were no restrictions. Uh, when it came to vote, did they have to qualify in any way? Did they have to do it in English, or were, what was the what was the rule? Uh, okay, so um, that depended on the states, but to this day, um, there are no literacy requirements. You know, you can sign with an X. Um, 
and that was the case in the 1800s. And um, there were, uh, by, by about 1850, maybe even 1845, 44, the election of 1844, um, there were, there were um, you can find political cartoons of Democratic Party operatives meeting the boats, okay? Most of the immigrants are Irish or German. The Irish speak English, although many of them are not literate. The Germans are literate, but they don't speak English. But the Democratic Party signs them all up in the eastern seaboard cities. I, I think we're just about ready to wrap it up here. It's 11.30. Um, thank you, uh, Don. And Don will, Don will be back next week. We're going to start with the 1860s. Uh, this was, of course, the Civil War years, but that's the background for the key issue slavery, and we'll hear about that next week. Thank you. <laughs>